This is a production of Cornell University. Good morning, everybody. It's a little bit after 10.45, uh, and so we're going to start the next panel. Um, it's a great honor for me to be here to celebrate 50 years of transformative teaching by Dan Schwartz. As Dan's colleague at Cornell for over 40 years, I've admired his intellectual range, his intellectual zest and curiosity, a zest that's produced extraordinary erudition, and I always note accompanied by an amazing uh, capacity for recall of detail, which Dan has, as I think you all know. Um, his intellectual discipline, he makes it seem easy to produce book after book. I don't know what the secret is, but he does that somehow. Um, but very especially his intellectual and personal generosity. And I really have numberless uh, examples of this, but uh, because we're a little bit pressed for time, maybe I can talk with people about them in casual conversations later. Um, I've been very, very touched to see the program today and yesterday um, with the names of students going back to 1970, and I think we have one of them on our panel today. Um, and all of them testifying to the deep sense of indebtedness to the teaching of Dan, and also to the bonds that he maintains with his former students over the years. And I often hear Dan saying, uh, I was in New York and I called former students and we went to the museum with them, and he's still teaching people. Um, and as a scholar of literature, myself, Japanese literature, it's, it's been very inspiring also to see the full list of names um, most of, most of you are either scholars or a former English majors um, who are now um, either scholars or teachers in our universities or also accomplished professionals, as many of the people on our panel this morning, in an enormous variety of different fields, uh, law, finance, journalism, computer sciences, policy research. Um, and I think that presence is both um, a tribute to Dan, that's why you've come from so far away, um, and a testament to the enduring ability of literature or poetry and reading, as Beth just told us, um, to sustain us in our varied lives. Um, so now for the good part, I feel very, very lucky to be moderating a panel where we actually hear from Dan's students with their recollections of their experiences in his classes. Um, and I'm really delighted to uh, introduce them. We asked them to send information and they all sent very modest little blurbs. So I probably could have given much longer introductions, but I'll tell, tell you what they told me about themselves. Um, I think I'll introduce the, all of the speakers now um, in the order in which they'll speak and then we'll just have each person come up um, as you're listed in the program to, to offer your, your um, reflections about working with Dan. So we'll be starting with Josh Gerber, um, who graduated in 2008, an English major. He is now an investment analyst at BlackRock. Um, our second speaker will be Grace Jean, who drove here from Washington, DC. Um, she uh, ha is a writer and journalist. Uh, for many years, she covered classical music for the Washington Post. Um, she's now a public affairs officer for the Navy in Washington. Um, Leslie Storm. Um, who is the clerk of court at the U.S. Bankruptcy Appellate Panel for the First Circuit, uh, who came here from Boston, Massachusetts. Um, our fourth speaker will be Beverly Tannenhaus. Um, she is a lawyer, happily retired and living in Princeton now. Um, she taught creative writing for many years at many different institutions and holds degrees in creative writing from two different universities, Brown and Johns Hopkins. Um, and finally, we have Zach Zahos, um, who is the most recent graduate from 2015, who is now a PhD candidate at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where he is studying communication arts and films. So a very, very warm welcome and thanks to all of you for coming and for sharing your thoughts and reflections with us. <laughs> Marsha and Dan, it's really nice to see you. And I'm very happy to be back in Ithaca to celebrate this with Dan. Um, so Sid Feld, the famous Hollywood screenwriting guru, wrote that every great story has a device that moves the action forward. That device is called a plot point. It is any incident, episode, or event that hooks into the action and spins it around in another direction. Looking back on my time at Cornell from the vantage point of 10 years, I can say that the definitive plot point 
of my college experience was Dan's seminar on Ulysses. Until then, I was drifting between majors and had little passion for the classes that I was taking. I met Dan and everything changed. In his seminar, I found my focus, I found an author and characters who moved me, and I found a great professor. Then I was lucky enough to have Dan advise me on my senior thesis on Ulysses. I would like to tell you a few of the lessons that I learned from Dan. First, Dan taught me discipline. On a very practical level, he taught me that the best writing is accomplished first thing in the morning and well in advance of the deadline. I remember during the winter of 2007 being in his office to review an early draft of my thesis. I could tell that he was less than impressed with my pages. While reviewing his notes, he suddenly asked out of nowhere if I had seen the Patriots game over the weekend. He went on to say that Tom Brady had delivered a flawless performance and had outplayed the opposing quarterback. Before I could respond, he said that I should try to be more like Tom Brady and less like that other guy. <laughs> Talk about having high standards. Another lesson that I learned from Dan is to always remember that art is about people. When you strip away the highbrow illusions and literary pyrotechnics in Ulysses, you are left with a story about a middle-aged guy and a young man who, after both experiencing great personal loss, are trying to find their way in the world. By reminding us to always consider the human element, Dan gave meaning to an otherwise chaotic and sometimes impenetrable novel. I also learned from Dan the merits and at times the necessity of challenging convention. My thesis, which focused on Joyce's fascination with Judaism, with how, with how Joyce's fascination with Judaism influenced the writing of Ulysses, would not have been possible without the groundwork laid by Dan. While it is difficult to comprehend today, there was a 70 year period from the publication of Ulysses in 1920 till 1922 until around the late 1980s, during which critics ignored Bloom's Jewishness. Even Richard Elman, Joyce's iconic biographer and himself a Jew, when asked about the novel's recurring references to things Jewish, responded that there was not much in it. When I was in the initial stages of researching my thesis, Dan shared with me an article that he published in 2003 titled Eating Kosher Ivy, Jews as Literary Intellectuals. In that article, Dan wrote, my generation of Jewish scholars was taught that it was best not to be too Jewish. Dan recalled another colleague telling him, as a graduate student, I was taught not to walk around with a Hebrew national salami hanging out of my pocket. Given this context, we can appreciate how groundbreaking Dan's book, Reading Joyce's Ulysses, must have been when it was published in 1987. Indeed, Dan was one of the first critics to realize that Joyce had envisioned a more prominent role for his heroes and his novel's Jewishness. Dan's contributions to the body of criticism of Ulysses has enriched our understanding of the text. It has been 10 years since I have graduated, but these lessons have stuck with me, and their relevance is not confined to a seminar on Ulysses. Even though my chosen career as an investment analyst may seem like an odd one for an English major, I apply the lessons that Dan taught me daily. Investing requires discipline and rigorous analysis. Investing is also about understanding people and their character. Deciding whether to invest in a business requires a deep reading of the management team and a determination as to whether they are reliable or unreliable narrators. Investing also requires knowing when to be a contrarian and to go against the herd. I am grateful for these lessons and I'm honored to help Dan celebrate his 50th teaching anniversary. Good morning, everyone. I'm Grace Jean, class of 2000, and I have, um, I feel super pleased to be here today and greatly honored to be part of this panel um, of students that Dan has influenced. And we've heard great remarks over the last day and um, last night at the dinner, um, just listening to all the tributes and all the toasts that everyone was making, it, it's incredible how much similarity there is between all of us, this connection that we have with Dan, and, and it's certainly terrific that we're honoring you today for 50 years of teaching, so congratulations. Um, so Dan has had a very profound impact on my life. I had the great fortune of first meeting Dan um, when I stepped onto campus and discovered that he had been assigned to me as my freshman advisor. And little did I know then um, what a great relationship we would build over um, what has been the bulk of my life these uh, 20 years. And 
Um, it was, it's, it's been a tremendous honor to um, not only call him professor, but also a great friend and mentor as well. So when I arrived at Cornell and I got the notice that Dan was going to be my advisor, I was kind of a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed freshman on my second day at Cornell, I think, and I took the initiative to email him, and I think I got a very curt, um, typical Dan response in return, and um, you may have been on sabbatical, I'm not sure, but the gist of his email was, um, you're super excited about being on campus, I look forward to meeting you, um, let's talk next week. And um, I felt kind of, you know, it was a little, hmm, this is interesting. Um, but we, when we sat down to meet for the first time, um, I just, I, I said, this is going to be a really great relationship. And I sought to take as many courses as, as I could from Dan. So I think I ended up taking a freshman writing seminar with him. I uh, took the modern tradition, imagining the Holocaust, and certainly the Ulysses seminar. And um, through those courses, and, and um, I also opted to have Dan become my academic advisor all four years at Cornell, and it was probably the best decision I made because um, he has had such an impact upon me um, personally, academically, and also now professionally, too. So seeing Dan in each of those different teaching settings, um, I wanted to share a couple of um, I think uh, we can all relate to this if, if you've been in any of Dan's courses. Um, one of the things that set him apart at Cornell, I think, when I was there, and I'll have to set the, the context for you. Um, so I was there in the late 90s, and this was pre-cell phone. Um, hardly any student carried cell phones at that time. We were mostly tethered to Ethernet. Um, you had to go to the library to check your email. Um, you know, most people did not carry around laptops. They certainly didn't have these. And um, so it was kind of a different world, and, and a lot of professors were kind of struggling to embrace the new technology. But Dan jumped right in there, and um, he used the virtual tools that were at his disposal. I remember having email discussions that were required. Um, you had to contribute at some point during the semester uh, to a discussion or bring up a point that we didn't get to in class. And everybody was um, encouraged to do this at some point in the semester. And I just, I remember sitting there stressed out about it, even more so than writing a paper for Dan. Um, just, you know, I wanted to make that point, And it had to be succinct. And um, I think he taught us a lot about um, just writing clearly and as succinctly as possible in, in that method. Um, he also encouraged us to have discussions outside of class. And um, I remember, you know, going to the art gallery with him and um, having pizza in College Town. I think a lot of you also had those kinds of experiences. And um, by the time I took the Ulysses seminar, um, I, I thought Dan did something really unique, and that was encouraging each of the students to take a chapter in that novel and teach it at one of our classes. So we were duly assigned a chapter, and um, you know, just just having that opportunity, he kind of gave us the opportunity at the lectern, even though there wasn't a lecture in class, but to lead the discussion. And, I, and to me, I thought that was really telling of his confidence in us and um, certainly the, the trust and, and um, the quality <clears throat> of teaching that he reflected in each of us as we tried to do the same. And you know, he would duly get up at some point and, of course, kind of take over the discussion, but that was OK. <laughs> um, so for all of that, um, I, I think uh, we're all grateful for the opportunity to, to learn under you, but also learn with you. And I'm certainly grateful to have had this opportunity to grow with you as well. So, And I have to note, um, I was a Chimes Master here at Cornell, and um, I think somebody last night mentioned uh, how he would attend performances, and he and Marsha would climb up the tower and surprise me at my concerts every now and then, and you know, I'd play a song for him. So it was, it was really a true honor. So thanks, Dan, and congratulations. The very best moments of my college career, indeed the most memorable, happened in Goldwyn Smith Hall and Rockefeller Hall. There I read and contemplated and discussed Jude the Obscure and Middlemarch. In fact, there on the table sits a visual aid of just how special these moments 
were and are to me. It's my college version of Jude the Obscure. It's old, although not so old that it's on papyrus or even parchment paper, but believe me, it has survived countless moves and crossed many state lines. It's a personal treasure. What a blessed, idyllic existence. My experience of college was not of the large lecture hall with throngs of students and classes taught by TAs. Sure, maybe I had one of those. I think it was Astronomy 101, which I needed to take in order to graduate, and that I managed only with the help of intensive tutoring. It involved a lot of math. No, my experience was of a more intimate setting. Defined, of course, by the wonderful texts we read, but even more so by relationships with people, with the likes of Dan Schwartz. Dan Schwartz knew us by name, and he knew about us. To me, my seminars with Dan were like conversations with friends. They were not lectures in which the students play a passive role. My English classes with him where I, were where I found camaraderie and intellectual challenge. That is perhaps the most stunning thing about my humanities education at a place as large and as grand as Cornell. There is something very human and humane about a place and a course of study which affords the opportunity to build lifelong relationships with minds such as Dan's. And it goes without saying that that relationship says even more about Dan Schwartz as a human being than even this remarkable place. So if you'll permit just a bit of personal nostalgia and walk down memory lane with me, I'd like to share that relationship with you and its influence on me. So I mentioned it started in Goldwyn Smith Hall, the place where I learned to read and write effectively and to think sensitively. And eventually, as a senior and an English major, I chose to write my honors thesis about Thomas Hardy and D.H. Lawrence, except that at the 11th hour, I became a bit distracted. And I wrote a very, very lousy first draft. In fact, it was so mediocre that my then thesis advisor suggested that perhaps I was not an honors candidate after all. So what did I do? You guessed it. I cried. I tore up the first draft. And then I went to see Dan, who expressed confidence in me, brought me back to center, encouraged me to stay the course, and agreed to guide me through the rewrite. And because of his encouragement, the second draft was a bit better than the first, and I did graduate with honors. So let's fast forward a few decades to the time when I am a mother of three daughters and the firstborn, like her mother before her, has not exactly crushed her SATs. So again, I reach out to Dan and he and I share emails about life and families and colleges and where to send this daughter to school. And I find that again, no, still, he is my professor and trusted friend giving me sound counsel. And then it's time to send this firstborn off to college and I am filled with terror. The send off is only moments away and I can count the moments of my influence dwindling. And one afternoon I have this daughter trapped in the car. She's a captive audience with her best friend and I hand each one an envelope. And in that envelope is a copy of Dan Schwartz's article containing tips for in college fresh, incoming college freshmen. So by now, I hope you're seeing there's a discernible pattern. Then comes daughter number two, and Dan's article by now has morphed into a book called How to Succeed in College and Beyond. And with the second child, I'm now a little more subtle. I wait until she's arrived on campus before I send her a copy of that book, and I've even highlighted it for her. <laughs> especially the chapter on the pros and cons of Greek life. 
Then comes daughter number three, and now I'm a relaxed parent. I don't send this one books or even articles. She's essentially on her own. But I have to tell you something uncanny. Not more than a month ago, when I went into her room to kiss her goodnight, I found her in bed with her laptop open to an article, and I spy out of the corner of my eye Dan Schwartz's name. I am amazed. What are you doing reading about Dan Schwartz, I ask her. And she responds, Mom, this guy wrote a great article about Greek life, and I'm citing it in my paper. <laughs> so you see this thread of Dan's influence continues in all facets of life, as a student and as a mother of students. But what about his influence and the influence of my college course of studies on me as a professional? What in the world is someone who's passionate about D.H. Lawrence and Thomas Hardy equipped to do, you might ask? To be sure, my parents asked this question. Well, I went to law school, and after some years as a commercial litigator, I became clerk of the court for the bankruptcy appellate panel for the First Circuit which sits in Boston. And there I draft the court's opinions, which requires me to read and write all day, every day. And it requires me to parse statutes, where even the placement of a comma can change meaning and the re change the results in a case and change the results of a life. This may sound like dry and tedious stuff, but don't be fooled. What is really unique about the court that I serve is that it is among other things, a court of equity, which means that the goal is to dispense with each case in a manner that's consistent, not only with the bankruptcy code, but with principles of basic fairness. We make decisions that affect people's lives and not just their financial lives. It's a painstaking process. It's a sensitive process. Oftentimes, there's an element of pathos and of tragedy, and by now, hopefully you're hearing intimations of Thomas Hardy. And not only are we required to deal sensitively with the litigants' lives, but there's also a meaningful amount of sensitivity required when telling a federal judge that he or she made a mistake and must be reversed. Word choice is everything. It matters hugely not only what you say, but how you say it. And there is where my English training and dance seminars come full circle. The other thing that's unique about the world of bankruptcy appeals is that it requires specialization in other areas, contract law, tax law, patent law. And so the process of reading and educating oneself repeats itself daily. I can't think of a better training for what I do today than the one I had on this campus in Dan's classroom. I'm grateful every day for the privilege of my education, and I am so happy to have the opportunity to circle back here with my family to say thank you to Dan for the role that he played and continues to play in it in the classroom and beyond. I, <clears throat> I'm Beverly Tannenhaus, class of 1970, and I regretfully say that this is the first time I've seen Dan in 50 years, but I want you to know you have been with me this whole distance. In my senior year at Cornell, three of my English professors shared their differing visions of my future. The first, a revered elder statement of the department slyly suggested that I become the paramour of famous men. <laughs> the second, also a distinguished professor, warned me against becoming a housewife in Scarsdale. <laughs> the third, a freshly minted scholar in his first teaching position, offered me the keys to the kingdom. Mr. Schwartz urged me to continue on to the PhD program at Brown University, his alma mater. Of course, I was enormously young and hell-bent on becoming a poet, so I didn't take it, but thank you, Dan. It's been years coming that I've recognized the enormity of what you gave me. Even in the period 1969 to 70, 
when gender and identity polit politics were unknown to me, I realized the diminishment of the first two alternatives. But you, Dan, a brand new professor on the job, sped past your elders to confer on a young Jewish woman from the provinces a place at the table. I hope I'm not gonna cry. You affirmed my intelligence, validated my worthiness. It's no surprise that in your classes, I found my voice. I was lucky enough to study with professors, including my long-term mentor, the late poet Archie Ammons, who brought both reverence and relevance to the study of literature. But Dan, you did all that and added joy to the mix. I remember you as a bullion, spirited, exciting, and you still are. I came from a high school of 150 students in upstate New York. I wasn't convinced that I was as smart as my impressive, seemingly more sophisticated peers. Though I remember being thrilled at being taught the tools of my trade, who is the narrator, and got good grades, I mostly kept my mouth shut, too intimidated to risk making a mistake. In your classes, that changed. You demanded critical scrutiny and hard work, but your infectious good cheer welcomed me from the sidelines. The staid solemnity of other classes disappeared. Intellectual engagement became fun rather than an ordeal. I lost my self-consciousness because you fostered the belief that I had something important to say, something worth listening to. Literary criticism in your classes did not involve mere detached expertise, but rather called for, demanded, the reader's engagement with the material, both as a critic and as an individual seeking the contours of personal identity. I clearly understood that textual analysis gave rise to self-reflection. What did the novel mean? And what effect did that meaning have on my own life? You introduced me to the work of Joseph Conrad and D.H. Lawrence 50 years ago when I was 20. Yet I distinctly recall the thrill of Conrad's scrupulous lucidity, the, despite the fact that English was his second language. His fascination of the abomination for half a century has explicated for me paradoxical realities from roadkill to contemporary politics. Not much of a distance these days. <laughs> I learned from D.H. Lawrence's depiction of libidinous abandon that impulsive decision was not for me. No mean feat in the sex, drugs, and rock and roll of the 60s. Many years ago, at a session of the women's writing workshops that I founded in 1975, Bertha Harris, a lesbian, was asked why she gave up her day job to start a publishing house to promote gay fiction. Her explanation still moves me, and I quote, without a literature, I do not exist, for the great service of literature is to tell us who we are. Surely she represents the spiritual progeny of Dan Schwartz. I am awed by the fact that you have inspired generations of students. I am one of them. When I taught college creative writing in American literature, you were the precedent of joyous engagement that I tried to bring into my classroom. When I switched careers to practice law, you continued as my background music. In closely examining legal texts and crafting logical, compelling briefs, I drew upon the skills you taught me at Cornell, and I never abandoned my novels. <laughs> Dan, I bear witness to your lifelong influence as a great teacher, teaching great literature. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Zach Zahos, and I graduated almost uh, three years ago. 
uh, which feels like a long time, but I guess uh, it's still at a quite early stage for me in my post-undergraduate career. Um, in addition to teaching me in three courses, Dan served as my English major advisor, and he served on my honors thesis committee as well. Uh, like most of us here, I also recall spending long and very leisurely stretches in his office and at various uh, eating establishments and even at various museums, right? Um, during all this time together, Dan said many things. But today I would like to share three quote, uh, quotes, or you know, three Danisms, as I'll call them, that I think about more and more these days in my shifting roles as a student, as a teacher, as a researcher, and hopefully soon a published author. Uh, the first is, I think, very familiar to us in this room. It's Dan's trademark credo, always the text, always historicize. Now on its face, read literally, the phrase actually does not make sense. You cannot do 100% you know, of two different tasks at the same time, all the time. Uh, Dan himself unpacked this saying of his for us yesterday. He said it's you know, emblematic of his pluralistic approach to literary, literary criticism as he conducts it and as he teaches it. I, I would only like to add that while I, you know, the, what I as a scholar and student, especially in graduate school these days, find so valuable about this signature Danism is the kind of paradox lying at its heart. Uh, by calling on students to do two distinct tasks at the same time and all the time, uh, Dan asks us to stay curious, to stay ambitious, and to make sure that we remain motivated from within. Uh, under his guidance, we discover, or we like to think we discover, but it really is through him, but we do discover that there is a gray area that we find are on our own, where impossibly high standards that Dan imposes and our own emerging, emerging uh, intellectual facilities meet. Uh, with his credo, Dan sets the expectations perfectly between professor and student, and perfectly for the student's critical life after class and after graduation. The second Danism is a little different, and I don't know if everyone here has heard this one, but I have found it incredibly useful. When in doubt, shout. I believe I first heard this one after a peer of mine bungled the pronunciation of Paul Gauguin in uh, our modernism class. I remember Dan just said, you know, when in doubt, shout. Just say the, say the name. You know, if, if, you, if you feel like you're not, uh, if you don't remember exactly how that one vowel sounded, just say it. It's better to uh, come across confident than not. I, you know, I, in my own teaching these days, I teach film production at, at Madison, I, I have turned to this advice to bolster my own confidence. I think often of the ease with which Dan regales a room and fills it with his own voice and insight. But I don't know how, if this has been mentioned too much these past two days. Uh, it, it really bears mentioning that Dan also has an amazing uh, soft vo uh, voice, an amazing whisper, actually. A voice that he turns to when reading aloud some of the most beautiful and haunting passages in the language. Uh, listening to him reread Heart of Darkness, I recall seeing you know, in my own head what Marlowe describes as the grass growing through his ribs how it was tall enough to hide his bones early on in that, in that work. Uh, Dan's soft-spoken readings really transported me to a new appreciation of literature, a way to see it uh, in, my own, in, my, in my own mind that I had not beforehand. But in hindsight, the ease with which Dan slides from loud to quiet, from clearly enunciated takeaway points to an appreciation of the sensitive and original details of a text has led me to really appreciate the act of teaching itself as a minutely uh, controlled performance, as something truly virtuosic. The last Dan quote that I return to often as a budding researcher and author, uh, you know, hopefully one day an author, is simply just good advice. And it's, when picking a title for your essay or book, start with a gerund. Publishers <laughs> like them, he says. <laughs> And uh, I, say, I will say in conclusion that I will uh, hopefully follow your advice, but only if you give me uh, added advice about what that gerund will be. So thank you very much, Dan. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, you are all star panelists, and those were just the most eloquent and moving statements. Um, they're no longer Cornell students, obviously, but there was a homework assignment for this panel, which was to offer a tribute to Dan's teaching in five minutes. Um, I think everybody got an A plus. And these were really very beautiful. And I'm going to remember some of the incredible phrases you came up with, like even a single comma, the placement of a single comma can change the course of a life. Amazing. So thank you so much. Um, we did try to keep the presentations to a certain time limit so that there would be some time to discuss um, a lot of the issues that were broached here um, with all of you uh, before the panel closes. Um, I did ask uh, our panelists to think a little bit about their perceptions of how the atmosphere um, around the idea of reading literature, the meaning of close reading, the meaning of, of, of literature and poetry for life um, has changed since they've been at Cornell. Some obviously have a longer perspective on this than others. Um, but I think maybe first I'll just see if anyone in the audience has a question that they'd like to raise, and then we'll, if, if, if not, we'll sort of move into that kind of discussion. So I'll, I'll open the floor first to questions. Okay, it's, it's always hard to come up with questions after um, such uh, words that are really moving as well as, as, well as eloquent. Um, so maybe I'll just um, turn to the panelists. Um, I know that you all kept your remarks very brief, um, but if you have comments, further comments that you'd like to make, we're very happy to hear about them. It's so good. I, 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 I really understand that. One just wants to kind of let the words sink in. Um, but, but OK, Beverly, great. I graduated in 1970. I'm a child of the new criticism. It served me well, or so I thought. I was also a poet, and I, and I love the textual analysis. And um, I know what's happened to me in my life is it's ruined me for any book club I've ever been in. <laughs> <laughs> because these people walk in and they say, well, I think it means this. And I said, well, that's really irrelevant. What did the author think it meant? And lo and behold, when I was trying to you know, catch up on 50 years of the evolution of literary criticism, I found out that a lot's happened since I left Cornell. And um, so I, I, and I know, Dan, you have mentioned the same phrase in one of your articles, but I felt the same way. I felt like Rip Van Winkle, wow. The wars happened just before I left. But um, I have to say that I feel a kind of um, sadness because of the perspectives, Dan, that you now bring to your literature. I, you were a wonderful teacher and I have no complaints and you did well by me, more than well. But I never thought about my Jewish identity. I never thought about the history. I never thought about gender. And I, I kind of um, wish that I'd had some of the richness that has been brought into, into literature. OK, we have Dan himself responding. Sure. Thanks, Dan. Um, one of the things, of course, yesterday I couldn't say everything, and I was improvising quite a bit. But when, I, when, when you uh, studied with I had just been trained really to read with blinders also. And later on, uh, I became a much more resistant reading reader. I mean, I kind of um, was ashamed that I didn't object in graduate school to ostentatiously anti-Semitic remarks by Eliot. In fact, I don't know, I said he was here by Troy Eliot this week, and of course called attention to and we get these semitism, say, in Gerontion. And what I began to do pretty early on was become, move away a little bit from that new criticism in which I was trained. I mentioned that. I was the purest of purest formalists, that novel program that I invented. I mean, I've talked about narrators within a text, which really was the beginning of my career to talk about them as uh, personas and some of the things I wrote about the narrator and the secret agent and, uh, on the Western Eyes really made my early reputation. And, uh, but then I began to realize that I didn't know how to read resistantly. A second example of this, which I think is important, is when I uh, wrote about the secret sharer in uh, my, uh, my thesis and even in my, my book, nobody talked about the fact 
that these two guys are naked and sleeping in a bunk bed that's about that wide. <laughs> I mean, it's certainly, you know, and, and staring at each other, that there's a clear, at least homo social, if not a homo erotic relationship there. And when I did the, uh, the Bedford, which on, on uh, which was a case book that really, my, I wrote three of the essays, so it was a seven, and, but five of them, four people were invited. We had five critical approaches. And when I did this in the, in the middle 90s, uh, every single critic whom I asked, and they were all very distinguished people, actually wrote about me, that relationship. But nobody talked about it yeah. when I wrote it originally, my book, in 1980. And then I actually went back and looked to be sure I was right. And there was like one small gay journal, which was almost distributed, like it was almost like a, um, a page of a, 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 it wasn't really even a journal, it was like a piece of paper, basically, that a handful of people uh, had, and very, it wasn't even subscribed in the library, that some people were just beginning to think about gay studies uh, mentioned. And so that's how literature has changed. And when I'm thinking about you, and even what you got from me, I realized we're talking a little bit about each of you belonging, or some of you belong to a different interpretive community than I will, and, then, and, and I was teaching them at different times when different issues were foregrounded. So now when I teach The Secret Sharer or um, Prufrock, and certainly Durantian, it's very, you know, different things are mentioned. And I talked a little bit about this uh, in, uh, with, with the Darwin example yesterday. And, uh, so we're always learning and growing. And, and just another, I don't want to talk too much here, but another example of that is we didn't talk about the role of women and how, you know, I mean, nobody told me in graduate school what really happens to Mrs. Dalloway. Here's a very bright woman. Where is her university education? Her life kind of stops in, in some ways, right, when she's 18 years old. When with, with Peter Walsh and Richard Dalloway, right? There's a kind of choice made. But you don't see, and we, we, where, you know, where in, uh, where's Molly's education? I mean, where she sits there at home, existing in the cupboards of men's minds, although she actually is, we now realize, somewhat more precocious because she goes out on tour, uh, right? With a big place, this is an impresario. The point is, of, we begin to think about things as resistant readers, and that's why I say the largest community of readers is one, but I think literature has changed. And we, one reason I call myself a pluralist is we try to be open to new things. While I made my reputation, to some extent, arguing that there was a, another tradition in the high point of deconstruction, I certainly learned from deconstruction, and I certainly learned from Met all kinds of approaches, gender approaches. So I think this is true. I mean, the audience has changed in another way that we just might mention. When I graduated high school, there were no gay students. There were no depressed students. There were no families with alcohol. And what, of course, I mean is nobody talked about those things. Nobody thought about but those they things. They thought about different ways. Right? Well, we, you know, when I went to back, you know, now. In, you know, my high school reunion, which I, I, I don't like high school reunions, but I went once, and you could see people with, a, it was a different story that people are telling, which of course is also, is both uh, personal stories and there's co cultural stories. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I hear you people, you're sort of, in some ways, reflecting where I was at a particular time. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to check my watch to see how much more time left, but I'm wondering if maybe, Zach, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but since you're working with media, I yeah. think as I, I notice in the information, you might talk a little bit about, re you know, what is reading, what, sure. what types of issues of reading are you dealing with now? Yeah, totally. Uh, well, I'm at a department in uh, UW-Madison, which is very proudly um, one that closely reads or closely watches the films that are the subject of study. Uh, and we kind of almost take such an aggressive approach to looking at style, looking at form, uh, and even just sort of looking at narrative structure of films that that's seen as potentially um, well. There's, there's there's talks of employment issues maybe later down the line, but there's there's a uh, 
there is a dilemma there, which is that how like pluralist can you be, and how many you know maybe more theoretical approaches can you bring into the study of media while still looking at the the films in this case for what they are. And uh, I'll say that I really have been actually just newly uh, inspired again by the talks of the last uh, 24 hours or so, thinking about how it, you can do both. And again, it's a, it's, it's a dance credo. You can do both of those things. Um, it's, it sounds like it's impossible, but it's not. And I think the new generation is uh, the, those of my peers at the graduate school uh, in film are, are trying to do that. We're trying to say we look at form, but we also look at um, the sort of cultural context underpinning the characterizations that we might see, maybe the political subtext, but uh, always also still seeing that what were the intentions of these authors or these filmmakers. And uh, for that, that's my main interest, and that really just comes back down to Dan. So that, that helps. It's, it's, it's truly an interdisciplinary credo, which is what's great about it. Yeah. Josh, I think your remarks might have been the, more, the most um, interesting and surprising for all of us because you talked about literary skills and financial analysis um, and made the very, very wonderful and a Danism type of connection that it's all connected to people, which I thought was a, a beautiful thing to say. So I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that that you just in response to the other comments? Or? Sure. Um, I, um, I think... A liberal arts education is uh, is wonderful, and um, I'm grateful for it every day. And I part of you know learning finance, learning accounting, and uh, learning math after not taking it in college or or really you know since since high school. Um, my current job was was definitely challenging, but it's all eighth grade math. It's all things that you can learn, but the concepts that and the the ability to think, which I think everyone here. Um, discussed is something that Dan and, and other professors at Cornell teach us. And having those skills is, um, where else are you going to have four years to just read literature and think about it and talk about all these ideas? Um, you're never going to have that, unless you go into academia, you're never going to have that opportunity again. And it really sets the stage for, for how you approach life and how you approach um, your work. And I think, you know, try to think about where, what silo I would fall into um, under the different literary theologies or, or approaches is probably a historicist. That's probably what I learned from Dan. And I bring that to my life every day and I think about where, where, where we are in terms of um, where we are in the world and where we are uh, in relation to the past and how that's gonna affect the future. And when I look at companies, I think about that too. I try to think about where, what's the story, what's the background, where are we going? And, um, and uh, you, it's very interesting to have someone from the, the bankruptcy appellate panel on the, on the panel. And I, I think Bloom would love that because Bloom is the humanist. And I think Bloom would, um, would find it appreciative giving people fresh starts. As you all can see, oh, okay, oh, Beth, okay. Beth. No, 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 we love questions, please. Okay, okay. Uh, well, first, I want to say, I think Pearl was right that the reason we all sat here kind of stupidly after you spoke is that those were such moving tributes. Um, so thank you. I mean, Thing. I say thank you as Dan's former student. Uh, but uh, I, what I wanted to ask you um, is, I mean, you, you were all English majors, and you all, I'm sure, are aware of the crisis in the humanities. And I mean, at my university, we have panels not in tribute to Dan or anyone else that I know of, but, but um, that try to um, encourage students to do a liberal arts education. And uh, I mean, I wish I could kind of import you, just like bring you right down. Um, but I, I, I feel that some of it falls on deaf ears. And I, I was just wondering if you could say anything about um, what you see about people in your workplaces, those of you who this is relevant, um, who have a more, um, who don't have that liberal arts foundation? I mean, of course, what I'm hoping is you're going to tell me, oh, they're awful. Um, <laughs> but but I, I just, I'm just curious to hear you reflect about what you see about what, whether there's a difference. I'll jump right on that because I am in a field. I work at the Washington Navy Yard in DC, so I'm surrounded by engineers, computer scientists, acquisition officials. Um, I'm probably one of 
a handful of English majors, I think, in my building. And the funny thing is, I find that I'm actually appreciated more in that environment than anybody else, simply because, and this is not a dig at anybody who is in the engineering, math, mathematics, STEM field at all, but they really appreciate people who can communicate, who can write concisely, who can distill what they're working on into plain English. And I find more and more that they're coming to me because I kind of, so I'm a, a science and math enthusiast. Not, I obviously did not um, pursue that as any sort of vocation, but um, so I write well and I hope I can communicate well. And I think they see me as that resource and more and more of them are learning, oh my gosh, you got an English degree from Cornell? Oh my gosh, that's fabulous. And to me that's affirmation for the, um, the learning that I got, the education that I got in the liberal arts here at Cornell. And um, to have that after, um, you know, 20 years ago, I was in this building and, and well, behind me. And, uh, and, and I was surrounded by friends who were in engineering majors and sciences. And they kind of looked at me askance and they said, so what are you going to be doing when you graduate? And, you know, it's, I'm making a living doing, uh, you know, pursuing um, a writing career writing career and, and all of the education and learning that I did here comes to bear every single day. So I'm proud to say, yes, I was an English major and I'm making it in life. <laughs> I, I see an invitation to speak in Texas in your future, I think. <laughs> um, Leslie, do you have any comments just in response to Beth's question? Well. I would say that in my environment as an appellate lawyer, there aren't many non-humanities types. So it's a place where I am at home, where I'm comfy. And we spend a lot of time, almost to the exclusion of anything else, analyzing what did the parties intend when they said what they said when they wrote what they wrote and how to give effect to those intentions. And then the next level becomes what did the judge think when he or she uh, wrote or said what he or she wrote or spoke. So it's all about being true to the text and being true to the narrator and then writing about it effectively. May I add yeah. something? Um, I, when I taught my students, uh, I also taught composition, and I would say, if you cannot communicate, you are impotent. You will be left behind. It's as simple as that. You have to be able to be coherent and persuasive, and I would add lyrical. And when I, it was a very easy transition for me to law um, on one level, because it was the close reading of text, it was the, the writing and the advocacy, it was a terrible transition in terms of the lack of passion and not trembling before the poetic word. But I will say that even when I wrote briefs and when I engaged in oral advocacy, I was so aware of the lyricism, of the placement of words, of the rhythm, of how they sounded. It didn't change. That was the way, I mean, I spent a lot of time reading and writing poetry, and, uh, but also in fiction. We looked at the lyricism, we looked at the words, we looked at the sound, we were trained to, to say, these sounds taken together emphasize, impact, diminish, whatever the meaning was. And I carried that with me, and I think that I was known, I mean, I was slow, I was disorganized, whatever, but I was known as one of the best writers because I put that together. And maybe there were, they, I mean, I don't know that I was surrounded by English majors, but I wasn't, even if I were, they weren't necessarily tuned into the language the way I was taught to be that way at Cornell. And I think it's an enormous advantage any, in any field because you will command attention. You will, the whole point of communication is to be understood and to persuade, and we can do that better when we're aware of it and we've been trained. So, yay for humanities. <laughs> Let, Leslie, did you, were you about to say something else? Yeah. Well, I'll reflect my own bias, but I'm sure that numbers can be a thing of beauty. But uh, for me, it's about the spoken and the written word every day. And I think a well-written 
appellate opinion is a thing of beauty and a work of art. And so um, my humanities education comes into play every day. I couldn't do what I do without it. I'll jump on that. Um, I reread Pride and Prejudice every year um, because I'm a huge Jane Austen fan, um, but also because I think I get something new out of it every year I read it. And, and I think it's a reflection of where you are in life at that given point in time. I'm a very changed person than where I was when I was, I think I read that the first time in high school, actually. And um, I took a class here on Jane Austen, and I think it informs us. For me, it's a way to refresh my, um, all the experiences that I had here at Cornell, simply because I'm in an environment um, in my daily life where you're as far removed from literature as possible. And um, for me, just to have that, um, you know, that me time to actually delve back into literature and, and reread and see my scribbles and the highlights and everything that I did at Cornell um, really brings that back and kind of grounds me. And so that's a text I return to. I've been trying to go back to Ulysses on occasion to read a chapter or two every now and then. And I think our, our, our life experiences kind of inform our reading. And that's something that I attribute to Dan because it was always an experiential um, thing to do here at Cornell with him. I think we've reached the time for the close of the panel. Um, I want to thank, first of all, Dan um, for imparting so much to all of the former students who have returned um, and the eloquence of their tributes. So thank you so much, and thank you to the wonderful panel. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.